Take one part, Murder Hogwarts. Take one part, The Gladiator. Maybe a hint of Dune. All in a grim dark world. What does that give you? How about The Trials of Ashmout by John Palladino? What's up, YouTube? Michael R. Schultheis here, author of The Rust of All Saga, which you can see, as always, on the shelf behind me. Today I'm coming at you with my review of The Trials of Ashmout by John Palladino. Now, I have to get a little something out of the way first. I actually know John in internet land, haha, uh -huh, through a Facebook writers group. In fact, he's really the only person that I like and respect and admire and think highly of in that group, if I'm being 100% honest. We also talk on Twitter. John's a great guy. So, can I honestly review his book? Yes. And that's what we're here to do today. But I wanted to be upfront. I think it's best to just be transparent about these things. John also has a booktube channel, Hot Takes Discussion. I'll link that below. Check it out. All right, so The Trials of Ashmount, book one, and the tragedy of Sedane. Now, first of all, they say never judge a book by its cover, but that's just complete nonsense. Come on, we all do it. And look at that cover. It's gorgeous. This is an original piece of art that he commissioned. It's entirely, it's entirely original. It's not, it's, it's a digital painting is my understanding. So the cover is gorgeous. It's seriously worth every penny he spent on it. What about the book itself? So this is a grim dark fantasy. What does a grim dark mean? Well, you probably know if you read fantasy, but let's just define it anyway. Grim dark fantasy novels are both grim and dark. They tend to be about people who are very sort of morally gray at best, and often they do very nasty things, and it, it tends to be a very nasty world. There's a lot of that here, although not all of his characters are that way. We'll get into that in just a moment. So this is a book where there are several point of view characters, and they have very different stories. Because you have several different stories being told here, I think it's actually better to skip what I usually do and try to give you an overview of the whole book and the plot and say, how does the plot work? Well, the plot is different for each of these characters, substantially, a lot. So there are several point of view characters, but I'm just going to talk about the four who got the most page time and stood out the most for me. Starting with Edelbrock Brendis. Now, this guy was my favorite, hands down. He's a great character. He is a real scalawag. He is a... He's a up to no good. So, Edelbrock is a nobleman. The culture that he lives in has this very sort of Roman vibe, because they have gladiator fights and they have an imperial system. But then you get this kind of European feel a little bit, too. Uh, it's a great, it's a great combination of influences in a, in a fantasy world setting. Edelbrock is not a good guy. In fact, he's up to no good when we first meet him. He's trying to forge something to gain an unfair advantage. He, he's engaged in crime. And so he's kind of a, he's, he's, he's a scoundrel, really. He's a scalawag. But, but I liked him because he's just, it's just very human. Edelbrock really goes through a lot in this story. There's a tragedy that happens early on that is pretty severe. He gets put into a very bad situation and some awful things happen to him. And somehow he manages to sort of rise up out of that and embrace the life of the gladiator that he's forced into. He's enslaved and ends up having to become a gladiator, which you might say that, well, I've seen that movie, you haven't seen it like this. He's a great original character who has this wonderful character arc where he goes from being somebody you, you kind of, you, you like him, but he's such a scoundrel, to somebody who is actually kind of heroic and has his own, is, is in many ways, is a lot more noble than he was before. So Edelbrock, for me, pretty much steals the show. He's, he's a great character, landed very well for me. All right. Another character, Villick of the Splintered Manes. He's a, 
He's a warrior in a desert culture. Now, I get kind of a Arabia before the rise of Islam vibe in a fantasy setting, of course. I don't know. John, if you're watching this video, I'd love for you to comment on where you got this the ideas for this culture because it feels very almost Bedouin, but then they have shamans and they have this very kind of polytheistic religion. And it's a, it's a cool combination. It's really neat. So Vilik is on his own journey with his people. There's some magic that starts to sort of surface for him and he doesn't understand it. So that's pretty cool. And there's a, there's a whole kind of invasion and, and uh, war narrative that, that I really enjoyed. Vilik was a bit of a challenge for me because he's just, he's very standoffish and very awkward. Now, I can, I can relate to that. On the whole, I really wanted to like Vilik, and I kind of did. But it was a challenge, and I think it just didn't quite connect with me as well as I wanted, as well as I wanted to. He just, he was just so much of a loner that it became hard to really quite make that connection. But on the whole, this part of the story is engaging. It's interesting. And I think there's a good chance that you'll like it. Now, third point of view character, Keldon Stuhl. This is a grim, dark spin on the farm boy from nowhere who has a magical destiny and goes on a great adventure kind of a thing. Keldon is from nowhere. He's going to go to the, the, the school of magic. Uh, that they, they do these things called the trials. The test to see if maybe you have the magic gift. And the thing about the trials, though, is that a lot of people die. It's kind of a murder Hogwarts vibe. It's a school for magic, but a lot of people die getting in. So what's up with that? Well, Keldon is going to try to find out. And there's a cool mystery here. I think that the, the magic really came to life here. There's a couple of magic systems in this book, and I'll, I'll touch on that later. But the magic is very well thought out. And the things that he does with it are very, they, they make sense, but they're interesting. Like he really, he, he put some thought into this. But on the whole, my, my deal with Keldon was that he was just, he was too callous. He was too completely uncaring about other people for me to really connect with him at all. Now, I like a certain amount of just characters being real bastards. Characters being callous and indifferent up to a point. Kind of works for me. There's a, there, you might notice a bit of that in my books if you read them. Just saying. I think I wanted to see Keldon care about someone or something beyond himself. And it just didn't feel like he got there. But still an engaging story. All right, we come to Saradel Wintlock, the most likable character by far, the least grimdark. Saradel is actually a pretty good person. Pretty decent. Wants to take care of her family. Some bad things happen to her and her family early on. There's an invasion. It's It gets pretty brutal. But she's just trying to stay alive, trying to take care of her family. There's a whole narrative there. This is more of a... It ends up being surprisingly hopeful. Which, now I say that I'm hoping that... <laughs> I'm hoping things don't get too bad for her in the sequel, because this is a world where bad things tend to happen. And sometimes even very bad things tend to happen. So, fingers crossed, this, I think that I wanted a bit more from her arc, from her story. I wanted a bit more to, a bit more of a sense of payoff, if I'm being totally honest. I'm optimistic we'll get that in the sequel. So those are the four characters I'm going to talk about here. Let's move on and talk about the world building. The world building is definitely a strength of this book. John really put some effort into figuring out geography, climate, and culture. And that's a thing that I fixate on a lot in my books. So I have to give him props here because it really, he put a lot of thought into this and it shows. The, the magic is another aspect that I really like. There's a couple of magic systems. There's an ancient one that has to do with elemental combat. It's really cool. It's, it's you just, it's so epic you just have to like this is this is definitely a, a a a strong aspect of this book and then there's another style of magic that has to do with using your life force for various effects a variety of things 
So you use your life force and you age prematurely. There's a real cost to this magic, as you can see. And what he does with this idea, the simple idea that you'll find in other series too, is very original. There's, there's these things called soul glyphs that you get tattooed onto you. And then there's other people who can, you know, do the glyphs or who can collect the power. And it's actually, I, I, what I love about this is he takes these, this very simple thing and he makes something really cool from it. So the world building is definitely a real strength of this book. There's another thing about this book that I love, and that's the prose. It's not ornate or flowery. Don't be thinking Name of the Wind or anything like that. This is more crisp, it's accessible, and it's engaging. And he has a flair for description. He knows how to describe something without using so many words that you get lost. In fact, it's very... It's, it's, there's a masterful economy of words that still puts you into the scene. Let me read you a very brief passage to show you what I'm talking about. Because this is... You just have to get a taste of John's writing. Here we go. Coarse sands. The hot, beating, unforgiving sun. A camel between his thighs. Curved scimitar blade hanging from his belt. And a spear balanced in his lap. An oasis of water in the middle of nowhere. A pause of life amid the harsh deserts of Vesia. That's a, that is a great description. And, and I, I just love these short sort of descriptive bursts that use so few words to, to put such a picture in your mind. So overall rating, my knee-jerk rating was four out of five stars, and I'm going to stand by that. This is a very good book and a very impressive debut. And I can't wait to see what John writes next. In fact, the sequel, Buzzard's Bull, is available for pre-order now, and I'll link that below too. So as usual, who is this book for? Who is it not for? Do you like Joe Abercrombie? Mark Lawrence? Other grim dark authors? Maybe George R.R. R. Martin? Get this book. It is totally for you. It's perfect for you. Mr. John Palladino may become one of your new up-and-coming authors to watch. Who is this book not for? Well, if you like conventional heroism in your books, give this one a pass. Maybe you like love, romance, honor. That's not this book. If you like people not getting stabbed, in other words, if you don't like people to get stabbed, definitely give this one a hard pass. With all of that said, if The Trials of Ashmount is the grim, dark fantasy that you're looking to add to your TBR, check it out. I'll link it below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll hope to catch you on the next video.